everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar, Fundamentals of Literacy Instruction and Assessment, Pre-K through 6, presented by Drs. Martha Haugen and Susan Smart. My name is Brianna Humphreys, and I'm the Marketing Manager for K-12 Education Products here at Brooks Publishing, who's the proud sponsor for today's webinar. If you aren't already a member of the Teaching All Students community, we would love for you to join. When you join our community, you'll have access to more webinars like this, as well as some special content and offers. You can visit the link on your screen to join the Brooks EdWeb Teaching All Students community. And speaking of special offers, I am excited to share that Brooks is offering a 20% discount on our website, brookspublishing.com, when you use the savings code EdWebLit. So this includes many of our books and resources on our website, including Dr. Haugen and Smart's new release, which we'll be talking about today during the presentation. I'm also excited to share that we'll be hosting a small giveaway today. So three lucky winners will be receiving a free copy of the new edition of Fundamentals of Literacy, Instruction, and Assessment Pre-K through 6. Winners will be selected at random from the live attendee chat and will be notified by email after today's webinar. If you'd like to increase your chances, be sure to stay active in the chat throughout the presentation. So without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenters, Drs. Martha Haugen and Susan Smart. So Dr. Martha Haugen, as a general and special education teacher, public school administrator, and university faculty member, has dedicated her work to improve the achievement of students who struggle with learning. She supports teacher educators, teacher candidates, classroom teachers, and specialists to implement the science of literacy. Currently, Dr. Haugen is a national consultant collaborating with the state departments and institutes of higher education to improve educator preparation. She also serves on the board of the Center for Effective Reading Instruction. Dr. Susan Smart is a senior research associate at Vanderbilt University, engaged in research, writing, and teaching focused on improving teacher preparation and reading. Previously, she was a national literacy consultant with the state departments, teacher preparation programs, and local school districts focusing on school reform, reading intervention for low-performing schools, using data to inform practice, developing response to intervention initiatives, and implementing scientifically-based literacy programs. Currently, Dr. Smart tutors and provides advocacy services for students with dyslexia. Welcome to Martha and Susan, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm thank Marty you. Hogan. I'm joining you from Los Angeles, and my colleague and friend and co-editor, Susan Smart, is joining you from Nashville. So this is really exciting. I wanted to um, start out with this quote that was written by Marianne Wolf in her book, Tales of Literacy for the 21st Century. I'm going to read it, but I'm also going to start off this webinar right away with modeling a strategy that helps students learn and pay attention and be engaged. So I am going to ask all of you to read the highlighted words or phrases that are in green. So, and I know I could hear you all over. I'm like Santa Claus. So uh, I also have one student who I know gets easily distracted. So I'm going to concentrate on her, right, Susan? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Well, she is going to read this aloud too. We know that literacy can open the mind of a child. Read it with me to whole new areas of learning, and that the very process of becoming literate can contribute to the new reader's creativity, personal growth, and together, thought. Thought. developing such forms of thinking in a society can fuel discovery, productivity, and innovation, which in turn can drive together economic growth, growth public, public health, health and the well-being well -being of that of society. society. So I thought that Marianne was very prescient to write this four years ago, and it's very timely. And it's one of the reasons why all our children have to be competent readers and, that's, and writers, and that's what we're talking about today. Susan's going to get us started now. 
Okay, next slide. So I am Susan Smart, and I am thrilled to be with you this afternoon from Nashville. You may say that thrilled or ecstatic or elated is hyperbole, but I want you to know that Marty and I have been thinking about you for at least two and a half years. Marty says three and a half years, but we've been thinking about what you may need as you face the many challenges of teaching all children to read. Some of you may be pre-service teachers just getting started on your teaching career. Some of you may be in the classroom now and already dealing with all the challenges of teaching. Some of you may be professors or higher ed instructors who are um, looking for a new resource to teach about the science of reading. Some of you may be administrators who are charged with making sure that all the children in their district or in their states are readers and successful readers. So it's with you in mind that we developed this textbook and we thought about all the things that you may have to face each day and developed um, our ideas for you. So when you, those who will be studying our textbook will become effective, efficient, and engaged instructors. Um, they will be able to understand the science of reading. They'll be better at designing lessons with integrating essential components of reading and writing instruction. They will be able to model and apply the features of effective instruction, use assessment to inform instruction, and increase the reading achievement of all students. So in the next slide, we, in our webinar today, in the next hour, we're going to share with you why we wrote this book, why during our retirement years, we decided this is how we wanted to spend our time. We'll give you an overview of the content of the book. Uh, we'll talk to you about science of reading, what that means, what structured literacy is. We'll talk about the effective features of instruction. And we'll take three essential components of literacy. There are many that we could talk about. But we're going to take three today. We're going to talk about phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, and orthographic mapping. And then we will tie up or end our discussion and send you forth. Next slide. So why did we write this book? Why did we do this? Well, as you know, the next slide, we have a serious literacy problem in the United States. At least, um, next slide. Yeah, our literacy scores are stagnant or even declining, and only 35% of students at the fourth grade level are at or above proficient levels. And now we even know that eight out of 10 black fourth grade children don't read proficiently. And according to Marnie Ginsburg, who developed Reading Simplified, we need to help teachers and schools expect that every child can be and should be a reader. Our teachers, schools, and communities have to change to find a way. As we prepare for an uncertain return to school in the fall here in the United States, we all have the opportunity to begin to dismantle the legacy of oppression. We need to seek solutions to improve literacy outcomes for all children and especially students of color. And then Tim Odegaard at the MTSU Center for Dyslexia kind of reminds us that reading and writing are human rights. All of us need to be engaged in equipping the next generation with the power of reading and writing. So this is our call to action. There are too many teacher preparation programs who aren't preparing teachers to be effective instructors with all students with a kids for whom reading is a challenge. We know there's a lack of alignment between the curriculum, the courses, the instruction, and the research. There's a lot of mismatch out there. And then novice teachers have insufficient practice um, while they're in training and feedback to help them become more proficient. So these are some of the reasons that we're concerned and that we, we wrote the book and we have more. Next slide. 
So our goal is to improve literacy instruction, just as your goal is. And to do that, we wanted to provide knowledge and practice so that all educators could implement the essential components of effective literacy in their schools or districts or hopefully in teacher education. We wanted to share scientific knowledge. We wanted to provide a foundational text, kind of a literacy text 101 or a beginning literacy text. We wanted it to have accessible language. I kept talking to Brooks about making it a friendly text. We wanted to provide lots of examples, both structured and explicit. And we wanted to give a reference guide. Next slide. And in developing this book, we called upon some of your favorite literacy gurus across the country. We have at least 12 contributors who have been classroom teachers, researchers, administrators, um, English language um, experts, geek experts. They've all contributed to this book. And you have a handout, I think, that you were given by... Um, Ed Webb that provides for you the names of all the contributors to our text and their background and description. So um, we applaud them and we're thrilled that they all agreed to contribute to our text. Next slide. So the design, how did we put this book together? What were we thinking about as we designed this book? Let's talk about that a minute. Next slide. This book has lots of different aspects. We start each chapter with a scenario, a real life scenario of what's happening in the classroom. We have objectives. We talk about effective instruction. We give examples of that. We have assessment for each chapter. We include the standards, English language, English learners, technology, reflection. We have knowledge um, assessments at the end of each chapter for those who use our book as a textbook. We have application activities so that the readers can use some of the information that they're learning in the text and discuss it and apply it. We have a tutoring component in our textbook so that the students who are Candidates who are using our book can practice in um, classrooms as they're learning new information. We have wonderful online resources for each chapter, and um, we definitely are related to Tier 1 and Tier 2 instructor instruction. For those professors who are interested in this book, we have sample syllabi for you. We have PowerPoints for every single chapter as we, we do have the reflection questions, the knowledge questions, and we give you the answers to those questions. So you're all set. Next slide. So the book is built around some big idea questions. There's probably six of those. Um, in every chapter we talk about what, what is the literacy component that we're discussing? Why is it important? And what does research say about the component? We talk about what students should know and what should they be able to do at each of the grade level in pre-K through six. We talk about how to teach, and Marty is going to talk more about effective instruction and the how to teach and not just the content for teaching. Next slide. A few more big ideas. We talk about how to assess the students and how much they are learning to see if our instruction is effective. We talk about how to use the data, how to um, adjust instruction based on the data that we gather, and how to use evidence-based curriculum and incorporate the standards. So those are the big ideas that you're going to see throughout the book. Next slide. So the science of reading and structured literacy. Marty, you want to talk about these? Sure. Next slide. You've probably heard the science of reading uh, term tossed around a lot. It's, it's become uh, popular all over, but it is very, very serious. And we've had this accumulation of science over the last 
50 years. So we have a lot of seminal research reports. I'm sure most of you know the National Reading Panel Report of 2000. And since then, there have been others on English learners and early childhood, or the two big areas that were added, which we also added to our book. So the science of reading in conclusion says that there is strong evidence for using explicit, systematic, and engaging instruction. And this is a little bit different than the common ways of teaching reading, which sometimes may be incidental or not very systematic. So we want to reach all the kids who need our help, and this, these are the ways to do it, as well as the identified um, essential components of reading. Next slide. So, and we'll go through these quickly. So phonological awareness, just slip through these, Brianna. You've all heard these. These are from the National Reading Panel. Next slide. Yep, phonics, next, just keep them going. Fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. We recently, the research has added oral language development, spelling, and writing as important components of reading and literacy. So we've added those to this text also. Next slide. So the science of reading has an emerging consensus literally thousands of studies that support these findings. And we can actually say that neuroscience is exploding. That's what Sally Shaywitz said in a recent book. And they've been able to use these brain imaging techniques and others to identify the neurological processes involved in reading. This is really important because we know that many children who struggle, including children with dyslexia, use different neurological processes. And through good instruction, we could develop the processes and the routes that work best for them. So we know that students must be taught to read. They don't have to be taught how to speak, but they have to be taught how to read. And let's go next slide. So one way to approach this is through structured literacy. And this term has been further defined in the last few years. Structured literacy means that your instruction is systematic and explicit. And we're going to talk about this more in depth in a minute. It includes listening, speaking, writing, and reading. The essential components include, and our book explains all of these, or you could ask questions later if you're not sure what these are, but they include phonology, which is the structure of language across the speech sounds, the writing system or orthography that also includes those patterns of word spellings, meaningful parts of words or morphology, which is important from very young age, they're saying. Relationships among words or semantics, and then the organization of spoken word and written discourse. Another thing that they mentioned is active student engagement. Next. Before we continue, Susan and I want you to know that although we are talking about the fundamental emphasizing the fundamentals of reading instruction, we realize and agree that comprehension is the ultimate goal. We want students to understand what they're reading and the ability to, to comprehend text depends on the ability to read the text. Let's go on and see about some features of effective instruction. Next slide. The features of effective instruction have been studied for many years. The model that we're using today is from the Meadows Center for Preventing Educational Risk at the University of Texas at Austin. But you'll see many others who have written about um, what are the most necessary skills teachers need to know. I like these 
for a couple reasons. First of all, in our first book, this was one of the most helpful sections of the book. We got more feedback on features of effective instruction than about anything else. And you'll see as we go through this that these features can be used at any grade level when you teach anything. So they are five that we're going to be concentrating on today. And you'll notice that although they're really easy to memorize, each feature consists of numerous complex practices. These features are modeled and practiced throughout the text. And also there are scripted lessons illustrating how the features are integrated and applied. We encourage those of you who use this to train teacher candidates or novice teachers to actually model the strategies. Susan and I were trying to think, how do we model these strategies in this forum? And it's really hard, but in your classrooms, you'll see. The first one is explicit instruction with modeling. So what this looks like is ex explaining each feature very in each skill you want to teach very explicitly and then modeling how to do that. And if you look at the next slide, please, you'll see two teachers working on modeling this in phonemic awareness. The bunny ears remind students to listen as the phonemic awareness instruction is an oral activity. And in the second photo, the student is using a say it and move it card to isolate three phonemes. Susan's going to be talking about this in more detail later. But that's modeling and then the practice. Systematic instruction with scaffolding is another essential feature. So this includes this, the scaffolding, which are temporary supports. In the next slide, 37, the scaffolds, the student is using a PVC tube to listen to herself say the sounds of the letter. And then in the other one, the teacher is using a whiteboard and circling the unexpected sounds in said, the AI, a feature he wants to emphasize for those students. Next slide. We said how often teachers don't have enough opportunities to practice and neither do students. And students need various opportunities to practice, but they need multiple opportunities. So what we wanna do is to make sure we provide opportunities for students to practice reading and writing throughout the day, distributed practice throughout the day, week and months is the best way of doing it. So for example, you could teach phonemic awareness for five, 10 minutes, three times a day, and you have more than enough time to have a great effect. Next slide. Anita Archer, I'm sure most of you are familiar with her, says that practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. That's why we want the students to practice correctly so what they permanently learn is to do things the right way. I get very frustrated every time I see a student in middle school spelling when, W-E-N. You know, no one has been able to correct that and have that student practice it correctly. Anita also talks about the drill and kill that you may have heard, but she modifies it to drill and skill. And we will show in our book that there are ways to teach students and allow them to practice that are not the drill and kill. We, I don't think we use any worksheets in our whole book. So we want to have those um, various op opportunities. The next slide talks about corrective feedback. And books and books have been written about how do you give feedback? But very often, our teachers are not taught the best way to give feedback. And we're talking about not only affirmative feedback, but corrective feedback. 
So we want to tell students specifically what did they do well and how to correct a mistake. And this could be done very easily, even in a small group, without pointing out a child who made the mistake. So for instance, if I had a whole class and Susan didn't understand my directions, which is my fault, um, to do that partial choral reading that we did at the beginning of the webinar, I could just stop explain it again and say, let's practice the first one together. And the whole class practices, because we all know if one student has questions, there are others who do also. So this is really important to provide that specific feedback and also specifically what they did well. You've all seen the students once they learn about using commas and you praise them for using commas appropriately in one sentence, well, then the comments are after every word or something. So they really will respond to our feedback. The next slide is ongoing progress monitoring. You've heard about progress monitoring. This has been uh, very important if you've implemented tier one or tier two instruction, how important this is. Well, we want to make sure that people use formal and informal methods to become aware of how students are learning the materials. The second edition has a new chapter that Susan wrote just about how to do assessment, including progress monitoring. The whole reason to do this is not to file those test scores off in the circular file cabinet, that trash bin, but to actually use the data that you acquire to inform your instruction, to plan what you are going to teach differently. On the next slide, you see a graph of the teacher charting the student's progress. So by dates, and she, she or he has a goal line, and um, they're working on establishing that. And then you know, if that student isn't making progress, that yes, indeed, I need to change my instruction, the materials, the group size, the amount of time I'm spending with that student, there's a lot of ways you could do that. And the book talks about them in quite detail. The next slide shows a student charting progress. This progress is for reading fluency. And when students do this, they are so excited, as are their parents. A lot of teachers use these student graphs to illustrate what their child is learning to parents at parent conferences. This is very motivating. Of course, like anything else, students have to be taught how to do it. In the book, we have a whole section about fluency, and it is very important. Fluency, you will learn, is not reading as fast as you can, but reading with accuracy and an appropriate rate. These are uh, with comprehension. That's the whole goal. It's not just calling out words. So let's think for a minute. Think back to the features of effective instruction and your instruction. Let's say you just evaluated a student, you assessed a student, and you find that student is not making expected progress. Go back and evaluate your instruction using the five features. How could you make your instruction more explicit? Uh, what are other ways you could model to enhance the student's comprehension? What can you do to be more systematic, to start with what they know, starting with small concepts, building to larger concepts? Are there some pre-skills you should teach or reteach? Are you providing specific and immediate feedback, just-in-time feedback. 
Another big one is how can you provide more opportunities for the student to practice to mastery? And should you progress monitor more frequently? So all these are tied in with specific instructional strands in each of the chapters of the book. Next slide. And it's really important when students are successful, everyone celebrates. We want to acknowledge that. Let's go on to the next slide. I hope you have heard of I do, we do, you do. Again, this is something that Anita Archer has framed for us and see how it relates to the features of effective instruction. And I'm going to modify it a little bit and think of I do, we do, we do, we do, we do, and then you do. That's when the student does it independently. So I do is the teacher modeling. We do is a supervised practice. And you do is when the students are released, the gradual release of responsibility to work on their own and practice some more. So in the I do, you're introducing the new material, modeling it, and then you're promoting ample opportunities for students to practice. The we do, you're intervening and reviewing if the students are not making progress and you're providing them a lot of ways to continue practicing throughout the year on these skills. And Susan, your turn. Okay, next slide. Next slide. We're going to just take a minute to talk about three essential concepts. And you know, we could talk about all the essential concepts of reading, but we'll talk about phonological, phonemic awareness, orthographic mapping, and phonics. So next slide. You hear a lot about the f words. And as Marty said, comprehension is the goal. We're going to be working toward comprehension, but there are stair steps. There are ways, uh, levels we need to go through in early reading instruction to get there. So let's briefly talk about each one of these. Next slide. What's the difference between the pH words, the f words? Next slide. You have seen the phonological umbrella. We've all, we love the phonological umbrella that talks about the sequence, the stages of phonological development. Deb Glazier and I took the umbrella back in 2010 and said, this umbrella needs buckets and it needs shovels. So we <laughs> broke down the steps or stages or levels of phonological awareness into our buckets. And you can see where when kids are around three or four years of age, they're first learning some early phonological awareness. And they think that words are all connected. Like what you're doing is a word. And it takes a while for them to learn that the car is blue is four separate words. So that's an early stage of learning about the sounds that make up our language. They progress into the different syllables learning about syllables, breaking syllables apart, blending syllables. And then we get to the individual sounds or the phonemes. When we get there, we've reached the phoneme awareness stage. And that's the big push you're hearing so much about today. Once we get to phonemic awareness, we are very much interested in segmenting and blending and isolating and deletion and all of those shovels that we have there for you. And if you follow David Kilpatrick's work, he takes that phonemic awareness and breaks it down into levels, two, levels one, two, and three, and says that by the time a child reaches third grade, they have, should have advanced through the third level of advanced phonemic awareness. So that's a snapshot um, that lets us look at the whole idea of phonological awareness and then for phonemic awareness comes into that progression of development. Next slide. So quickly, phonemic awareness we know is the most essential skill. All students must master it. For some kids, it's much easier than others. They just intuit rhymes. They intuit beginning sounds. 
But for our struggling readers, especially, this is an area that we have to spend enormous amount of time. Um, basic skills, kids need to learn to discriminate the letter sounds um, to segment. And I'm going quickly because we're getting short on time. But these are examples of things that you will learn as you um, read our text. Very explicitly, we talk about examples of phonological awareness and give many activities for practice of those skills. Next slide. And examples from the text, we do a lot of modeling, just as Marty talked to about I do, I do, I do. We do together, lots of we do together. And then we ask kids to you do, show us the sound that you hear. There are many resources in our book, help making sure that all instructors are pronouncing sounds, the English sounds correctly. Reading Rockets has wonderful videos. And um, we have ample opportunities for practice, 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 as you are becoming uh, a proficient, efficient instructor. Next slide. Uh, stay at Move It card. We know, I think Benita Blagman back in the early 2000s introduced us to this. So this is an example of an activity that we have in the book for our tutors. So the people who are taking the course and using our book, the, the tutors to use with their students. Next slide. Uh, this is an example of Isaac, one of my students, and he is showing us some um, phonemic awareness in this activity. Even though you see man written on the board behind him, he doesn't see man. Man is there just to let you know that's the word I'm saying to him. And he is segmenting and counting the sounds that he hears. So he goes, mm, ah, mm, shows me his fingers. Next slide. Then phonics. So that's a quick overview of phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. Phonics is something that you most all know about. You hear phonics referred to as speech to print, decoding, the alphabet principle, phonemes to graphing, phoneme graphing correspondences, and all of that is referring to the idea that those squiggles on the page that kids see initially are letters, and that those letters represent sounds, and that it's necessary to read words. Kids need to learn to decode and spell words, which is encoding. So we have two chapters on phonics. Next slide. And phonics instruction is essential. And we uh, reinforce what we know about structured language. And that is that the instruction must be intentional, must be systematic, must be sequential. And that with that type of instruction, rather than random or haphazard instruction, kids, we will prevent reading failure. We also use systematic, explicit, intentional instruction when we are remediating our older readers. And um, that form of explicit instruction uh, improves reading proficiency for all students. Next slide. Orthographic mapping. So the hot words that you hear now, if you're floating around social media, you're going to hear phonemic awareness, you're going to hear orthographic mapping. And so orthographic mapping, this gives us an idea of what we're talking about. Joan Sedita helps us to understand that we hear sounds or we're aware of words in three different ways. The meaning of the word, the sounds of the word, and the letter of the word. So if you look at this slide, you can see that a child may know the meaning of bed as they learn from logical awareness, we help them to learn to segment the sounds in bed, b, e, d. And as they progress, we want them to match the sounds to the letters so that they'll be able to spell bed. So that's the foundation idea behind orthographic mapping. And if the next slide, you can see that 
Um, it looks like when you're doing orthographic mapping, you're often using um, grids or blocks to help kids um, separate the sounds or the phonemes they hear and then match them with the orthographic representation. And through this orthographic mapping, the words become, quote, sight words. This is the way the brain research now is helping us to understand that kids store information, lock information, map sounds and letters into their brains for permanent memory. So orthographic mapping is essential for learning uh, all words to become sight words. Next slide. So this is what it may look like with some older kids. You get the ideas that the kids will put graphemes to represent the sounds. And there are different ways to indicate, like in the word cute, they can make an error to indicate that that final E is impacting the U to make a long U sound. So there's lots of activities for this. The um, uh, uh, Texas site, I'm not sure that it's on here, but it's in our references. The uh, building RTI at University of Texas has a great um, video on is showing exactly what um, orthographic mapping looks like. There are many YouTubes for it as well. So jump on and learn um, what you can about orthographic mapping. Next one. If, okay, Marty, I think this is you. It is. Yep. All right. So you've seen a lot of the things that we have provided for those three areas. And you'll notice that we have a lot of scaffolds for the reader. We want to model these appropriate things. So you'll see outlines of lessons. You'll see scripts with explicit verbiage. You'll see sample schedules for daily, weekly, and monthly. And you'll see shared experiences of veteran teachers. There'll be personal reflections. And many of these things were written um, by Heather Haynes Smith and Suzanne James, and a teacher helped them. And I'll tell you, that's a fabulous chapter. It's toward the end of the book, so make sure you read the whole thing. Let's summarize what we've talked, and then we'll be able to have some questions. Next slide. This is Tolman. Carol Tolman is also a contributor to our book. And she developed this hourglass, and it's a very um, succinct summary of the skills, starting with phonological awareness all the way through orthography. And I know it may be hard for some of you to read, but it includes the various steps that we know from early syllables, alliteration, onset rhyme that Susan uh, was talking about before. And then the basic phoneme, like segmenting and blending, which most teachers do a little bit of, and then they stop and rather than going on to the advanced. And that's where you're deleting phonemes and substituting phonemes. And it's a really, um, advanced skill that you could use through third grade or even older for with older students if they're struggling. And then you have that connection between the sounds and the graphemes or the letters. And that's the last part of the hourglass. You're going from graphemes all the way through different things, including morphemes, etymology, until you have orthography where you could read and spell these words. And I often call this part word study. You're really getting into the depths of understanding our language. Next slide. So what's next? Next slide. This is a, a quick overview of what teachers need to know. This book is not meant as the be all and end all. It's an introductory book, like an anticipatory set so that teacher candidates, novice teachers, others will be able to understand or have a basic understanding of these concepts so they could go on and study it in more depth. So we know that teachers have to continue learning 
they need a lot of teaching experience with feedback with a coach or an instructor and additional study. And the big thing, practice, practice, practice. And I'll tell you, Susan and I learned so much after writing this book. And we've been in this field, I think we figured 100 years between us. So <laughs> we're still learning. All right, next slide. Our overall result is that we want educators to be competent, effective, knowledgeable, and efficacious. They're more likely to stay in the field if they feel like they're doing a good job, and we want to give them the tools to do a good job. And more importantly, our focus is on students becoming competent, proficient, knowledgeable, and efficacious readers and writers. That's what we're working for, and we know it can be done. Next slide. <laughs> All right, so and this is the inspiration for Susan and I. These are our grandchildren, and they're all readers, including little Samuel there. He's just very precocious at one year old, but uh, this really is keeps us going. I'll tell you that. Next slide. We have some references. You'll see on law, in the book, we have hundreds of great references. And the next slide. And I will just end with this one and say, if you're so excited after listening to us for this hour and you want to race right out and teach a child to read, these are some resources that you can use today and tonight, tomorrow that are online. You've got... Um, the University of Florida Literacy Institute, which is Holly Lane's work that is virtual. Um, anything you want to do uh, just about with early literacy, she and her graduate students have put together online so you can teach virtually. Um, we, if Those of you that are in social media would probably love knowing, and you probably do know about the science of reading, what I should have learned in college that was started by our friend Don Heinmick, um, and she now has 30,000 followers on that site. So the science of reading, what I should have learned in college. And then Stephanie Stoller has uh, started a new site that's for the higher ed professionals. So look for Stephanie Stoller's work too. Training reading rocket scientist is a wonderful one. So um, go forth, change the world. We are so excited to be able to share our work with you and look forward to helping uh, answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, thank you for joining us today. And Brianna is going to handle questions and closing. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Martha and Susan, for a wonderful presentation. There's been so much positive feedback and discussion in the chat, so I'm really excited to jump in. Um, I did just want to provide a quick reminder that we are going to be hosting a giveaway today. So for three lucky attendees, um, we'll be reaching out to you after the webinar, and you'll be receiving a free copy of Martha and Susan's new book, so be sure to check your email. Um, also, just a reminder, before we jump into the Q&A, you can save 20% on the new edition by using the savings code EDWEBLIT at checkout at brookspublishing.com. Okay, so I do want to be mindful of everyone's time, but I think we have time for just a few questions this afternoon. Um, so one of the questions we've received is, uh, Martha and Susan, can you talk about how the implementation of word walls might change when you're basing them on the science of reading? Do you want to do that one, Susan? Sure. We, we both can do that. Historically, word walls have been designed by using the letters of the alphabet and then having kids uh, talk about words that start with that letter. And now with sound walls, we're saying that kids should think about words and how they sound. So if you had the word this or there, you might put that under the T a letter on your um, word wall historically, and now we're talking about the f sound. So let that represent 
and reflect how you are organizing and sorting your words by their sound, not by the letters. Right. So like in my name, the O-U, I think it makes five or six, maybe eight sounds. I have to look at that. So you wouldn't put cloud and though in the same spot on your sound wall. So we're really emphasizing the sounds of words. Some, some even are out there and we talk about them in the book where they have pictures showing how do you make the different sounds. So you see the mouth of students as they're making the sounds and then they post samples of words underneath that. So you'll see all of that in the book. Yeah, that's known as articulatory gestures and that's just a wonderful way to help kids discriminate or differentiate between sound by what does their mouth do? What are their lips doing as they make sounds? It's a wonderful aid to help kids associate talk, sounds. Talk about letters. explicit, right. <laughs> yeah. Another question we've received is, do you have any suggestions for a teacher who might be moving from the classroom to reading support? Yeah, everything well, in our book works with yeah. struggling kids. So it may, she may need or he may need to refresh some of the critical components of instruction that are in the book and just brush up on some of those and then think about repetition. We just know that struggling readers require so much more repetition than non-struggling readers. The other thing to think about is most schools are implementing MTSS with the three tiers. Our book focuses on tiers one and two, including interventions for students who are struggling in tiers one and tiers two. Then when students are still not making sufficient progress, they may need one-on-one -on -one or very small group intervention. Sometimes that's a tier two, sometimes it's a tier three, sometimes it may mean special education. We found that the first edition of our book was used by all teachers, including special education teachers, because they had to get back, like Susan said, to the basics of good instruction and know how to intensify the instruction, giving more time, more explicit instruction, more practice, smaller groups to help those students. Next. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that response. Um, another question we've received is if you could talk a little bit more about critical knowledge. You mentioned it briefly at the beginning of your presentation um, in regards to teacher prep programs. Is that question referring to some of the work that's been published recently about helping students gain content knowledge and, and world knowledge? That certainly, if so, that is absolutely essential. We have made, uh, I would say, a misjudgment with good intentions for many children saying we have to concentrate on the basic reading skills. They can't read these more difficult, complex texts. And they don't learn about all the world knowledge that they need. And Tim Shanahan and others have found that giving students more difficult books with more content with teacher support, they actually can learn to read better and they learn more. So we mustn't forget about the knowledge. I mean, Susan and I are very supportive of that. We go into it a little bit in the book. Um, but that's not our focus. Susan, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I would agree. Plus, we always for years talk about building background knowledge and assessing what the kids know before we just start talking about salamanders or the hamster wheel. Um, so I think um, sound instruction does and has historically has determined what kids bring to the process before we just start teaching a new concept. So that's woven in as well as with all of Natalie Wexler's work on the importance of background knowledge and general knowledge, foundation knowledge. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question today and then we'll wrap up. Um, so 
one question we've received a couple different ways is if you might have any support um, or suggestions for a first year teacher who's building their capacity to teach reading virtually. Ah, jump on University of Florida's um, Literacy Institute hub. Uh, you could learn everything you need tomorrow from Holly Lane's work there. It's um, wonderful. She teaches, you know, five kindergartners phonological awareness virtually. So you'll find it a wonderful resource. Good. Great. Thank you so much for those suggestions, Susan. And thank you both so much for joining us today and for giving this wonderful presentation. And thank you to everyone who attended this webinar. We really appreciate you spending your time with us this afternoon. For those who are not a member of the Teaching All Students EdWeb community, we would love for you to join us. As I mentioned earlier, when you join our community, you have access to more webinars like this one, as well as special content and offers. Um, it's also how you can access the webinar recording and um, the handouts that were mentioned throughout the presentation. So on behalf of Brooks Publishing, EdWeb, Martha Haugen, and Susan Smart, thank you so much for right. taking the time this afternoon, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. See you next time. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thank you. Change the world. Bye. See ya.